Today we're going to be taking a look at a cooperative board game set in the DC Comics universe, Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Before we get to review the review, we do have to take a moment to thank Ravensburger for providing us with a review copy of this game. Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons was designed by Prospero Hall and features artwork from Jenny Friesen. It's a cooperative card-driven board game for two to five players, with each game taking an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how much planning the players decide to do. This was published in 2020 by Ravensburger and has an MSRP of $44.99 US dollars. In Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons, players each take on the role of one of DC Comics' Amazon characters, including, of course, Wonder Woman herself. Players will use their Amazon to defend the island of Themyscira from an outside threat. Threats included in the base game box include Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Gameplay consists of players using cards to program three actions each round. The twist is that players only know what two of the five cards they will get to choose from while discussing plans with the other players. For a look at what you get in the box, be sure to check out our Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons unboxing video on YouTube. In regards to the components in Challenge of the Amazons, I have to say I was mostly impressed. Now, one thing I was a bit disappointed by was the miniatures are plastic and they're painted to look like metal. And the only reason this disappointed me is when looking at pictures of the game, I actually thought it had metal miniatures. So that's my own unreasonable expectation, especially at that price point. But I will admit I was a little disappointed to find they were plastic. Either way, they are really nice looking miniatures with lots of detail, probably take a coat of paint really well. The quality of the rest of the stuff, the cards, the board, the cubes, other components are all excellent. And the game features a really well-designed plastic box insert to hold and keep everything in place. Though if they do ever put out an expansion for this game, I don't think it's going to fit in the base box. The same sort of quality in the box that we've come to expect from a Prospero Hall game. So what exactly are we doing with all these components? How does Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons play? First thing you need to do is pick which of the three villains you'll face. So you have Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Now, each of these villains plays differently and changes the overall feel of the game. Now, Ares is considered the easiest to defeat, and the rule book is actually written assuming you're fighting Ares on your first play, and it doesn't even mention the other gods or enemies. Sorry, Cheetah's not really a god. The other enemies until you get further into the rule book, where it's like, all right, if you're using these other villains, you do this instead. A nice mix and match way to ensure that you're not stuck playing the same game over and over mm -hmm. while reusing components. Now, once you have a villain, each player is going to pick one of the five Amazons to play. Each has their own unique ability, of course, to make them stand out. The characters include Diana, which is the, the Wonder Woman that everyone should be familiar with, Nubia, Artemis, Mala, and Philippus. Now, each has its own little small player board, uh, and uh, with that unique ability listed on it, and basically a spot to place three cards. Doesn't really serve a lot of purpose, like you could probably do without it, but having that reminder of what your power is is nice. Uh, your miniatures are going to be starting on the palace, put it it's kind of in the center of the board. You're then going to take four random relics and shuffle them into the hero card deck and then set up the board based on which villain you're playing against. Now, I can't get into the details of this because they're all completely different, so this includes setting your starting defense for Themyscira, the villain's health level, shuffling the appropriate villain deck, every villain has their own, placing a villain standee on the board, which represents where they are, and placing some cubes out on the board. And this is where we start to really see the reuse of materials in action. Yeah. Now, one of the things that gets reused from all of them is that there are plastic cubes, included in the game in four colors. Now, white cubes are always Amazon warriors that you can recruit to aid you in the defense of the island. They are white kind of semi-transparent cubes, good quality. The other three colors, though, which are purple, orange, and green, represent obstacles. And what exact obstacles these are depends completely on which villain you're facing. So for example, if you're facing off against Ares, purple cubes represent corrupted Amazons. Orange cubes are Ares' servants of war, and green cubes are blockades. Now, if you instead you're facing Circe, the same cubes in the same order represent magic beacons, or sorry, magic beacons, wolf Amazons, and pig Amazons. Simple and efficient. Now, no matter what enemy you're facing, the goal of Challenge of the Amazons is always to defeat the villain before the island's defense is reduced to zero. 
Each round and challenge of the Amazon is broken into four phases, and here's what happens in each. So at the start of the round, the enemy goes. They act. You're going to draw cards from the enemy deck and move the villain on the board, as well as place one or more obstacle cubes. Now, again, these obstacle cubes could do different things. Like sometimes they will represent different things and they might replace warrior cubes. For example, the corruption and so on, you'd replace a warrior with a corrupted Amazon. Now, depending on what villain you're facing, other things may happen is probably the best way I could describe it. Like cubes on the board may move. Now, again, here's an example from one of the three villains, which when you're facing Ares, at the end of every villain phase, the corrupted Amazons, the, the purple cubes move towards the palace each round. The next phase is strategy guys together. Players get two hero cards and discuss their plans. Now, each hero card has a thematic name, like nimble, confident, or adaptable. In the next phase, players will receive more cards, and they're going to choose from all of the cards they've gotten to program three of them. So during this planning phase, note you only have two of your five cards, and you have to program three reviews. Or, sorry, three, um, three actions. So you don't have all the information you need to make a perfect plan. There's always some information missing. So this is a great way to help minimize quarterbacking as people will still have to make decisions on their own, regardless of what group decisions are made here in this round. Yes. So the next phase is battle begins. Here's where you decide what your three actions are. So you've discussed your plans. You've got your full hand of cards. You've got to put down three of them on your player board in three spots. One, two, three. Now, the important part here is the players aren't allowed to communicate anymore. No more talking, no more discussing plans. You have to plan out your actions without any outside input. And it's up to each individual player if they're going to follow that plan they just discussed in the last phase. Or based on their cards, they may come up with something even more heroic to go do. It's always easier to write a rule against table talk than it is to implement it. Very true. I admit that is one of the hardest things while playing this game is to not <laughs> actually give away any information. So now everyone's got everything programmed. You're ready to go. You now take your actions. You now do it, right? You did your plan. Now you do it. You reveal the card in the first slot. Everyone reveals the card in the first slot. And then you're going to take one action based on that card. Once players have taken their first action, then you're going to reveal your second card and everyone takes their second action. You reveal the third card. Everyone takes the third action. Now, these hero cards are going to feature from one to three icons on them, and they're going to have a rating for that icon from one to four. These icons represent four different things, wisdom, vigor, agility, or leadership. Now, to complete an action, you're going to spend the points from one of these. So even if the card has three icons on it, you only get to use one of the icons on each card. Now, two of the event actions in Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons are identical. It doesn't matter who you're playing off against. You can always spend agility to move between regions, one point per region, or leadership to recruit Amazon warriors, which are white cubes, which we mentioned earlier. And But that can only be done on certain points on the map. Once you've recruited the Amazon warriors, while you're doing that first move action using agility, you can bring the warriors with you, which represents your Amazon like leading the armies around the map. Now, the remaining actions completely depend on which villain you're facing and completely change. So for example, if you are challenging Ares, you can spend three wisdom to remove a corrupted Amazon from the region you're in. You've convinced the Amazon the error of their ways and they switch back to your side. Or you can spend two vigor to remove a servant of war, which is an orange cube, which obviously you fought or defeated the servant of war. Or you can spend three agility to move a, remove a blockade, which are things Ares is going to put on the road to make it hard to move around. Or you can spend four of any icon to actually damage Ares by one point. And note, you can put these up higher. So like if you can do six icons, you could, or whatever, six wisdom, you could remove two corrupted Amazons. And if you can manage to get 12 of one symbol somehow, you can damage Ares by four, three. So all in all, a seemingly well-balanced, well-thought-out approach to this co-op that reduces common problems for the genre, while also ensuring that the game doesn't grow stale quickly. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, in addition to this, many of the hero cards have text on them that do things, right? So, for example, I'm not going to remember the exact name of the card, but say, say Vigor may say you can double the value on your Vigor card if it's played in your first slot. And another one may give you a bonus if it's played in the second slot. One of them is if 
other characters have played the same card in the same phase, all of you double your icons. Or there's another one that doubles all of your allies' stuff if they're in the same region and so on. Now, along with that way to kind of combo together, players can also work together. They can cooperate, or characters can cooperate while the players cooperate using their characters because whenever their miniatures are in the same region, they can combine the values of their symbols to make one big action. And this is useful for getting up to those harder to reach higher totals, especially like trying to damage a villain, like hitting Ares with a 12 wisdom all at once. Finally, we come back to those Amazon warriors that you've recruited and are moving around on the map. Anytime taking any action, you can spend Amazon warriors. You just take one and remove it from the game and then get a bonus to one, whatever symbol. And it can be any of the symbols in the game. So you can push up, bump up your, your special actions. If during this action phase, you manage to reduce the villain's health to zero, the players win. Certainly no confusion over your in-game conditions. Then you get to the final end of round. If you haven't won the game yet, the enemy attacks. The island's defense is reduced based on which villain you're facing, and that is driven by what obstacles are on the board and where they are on the board. So again, I'm going to use Ares because that's the basic game as the example. Your group's going to lose one defense for every region with a Servant of War in it. Doesn't matter how many in each region, just each region that has a Servant of War, that's one defense down. You're going to lose two defense for each corrupted Amazon that's made it to the palace. And you're going to lose three defense for any region that has five or more obstacles in it. If Themyscira's defense rating hits zero, the players lose the game. And the enemy doesn't move again after the beginning of the turn. So you've had that whole round to know mm -hmm. where these attacks are going to take place. Yeah, there's a lot of tactics and strategy there planning how to make sure you lose the least defense at the end of the round. Now, in addition to this, uh, being a card-driven game, there are, of course, some exceptions. Um, there are a number of special rules, depending on which villain you're facing. For example, each time you actually hit Circe, she summons magical lanterns onto the board, and those increase her defense. There are lots of these little exceptions. Now, along with the action cards, uh, there's something I mentioned right at the beginning of the game, you're going to seed the deck with four relics. When one of these relic cards comes up, the player gets a choice. They can just discard it and draw another card, so keep just taking more actions, or they can choose to discover the relic. When they do that, you're going to put a token on the board based on what location it says on the relic. Then if later anyone moves on to that region, they get a chance to pick up this token and then claim the relic. Now, each of these relics breaks the rules in some way. For example, the Girdle of Gaia lets you double the symbols on a nimble card, which is one of the different power card types. The Lasso of Truth lets you move obstacles with you as you move around the path which is really handy for herding pigs when fighting Circe. Because who isn't thinking about herding pigs when you're getting ready to delve into the DC mythos? Ah, definitely fits. Uh, play continues round after round until either the defense of Themyscira falls to zero and the players lose, or until the players win by reducing the player's health to zero. Or sorry, not the players, the villain's health to zero. Note, there is no way for your individual characters to die here. That is not a thing. You are, it's the island's defense level. If your group's finding the game too easy, uh, each villain also offers a difficult mode with an increased starting health. Now that we have a good idea of how to play, what did you think of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons? I really wasn't sure what to expect from this game when it showed up. Uh, with all the buzz around Prospero Hall, like everywhere I am hearing Prospero Hall and the huge success they've had with some of their games, like Horrified and Disney Villainous and Hogwarts Battle, I just expected to hear a lot more about this game. Instead, there's like no buzz at all. Like the big tabletop gaming podcasts I listened to, if they mentioned it, it was only in passing. And I don't really see anyone talking about it on social media. I don't see it popping up in my Instagram feed or anything like that. And now that I've played it, I'm kind of confused because this is a really solid game. It features excellent production values. That would have been nicer with metal minis, but a great rule book, engaging gameplay with lots of replayability. Yeah, so there was a burst of buzz upon release. I remember seeing it scroll past on Twitter. Uh, I assume from their go-to reviewers who handle all that hot new newness. But then within a day or two, nothing. Yeah. And sadly, what seems like a solid game has already, I believe, been seen discounts. Yeah, it is uh, seen quite deep discounts, to be honest. It, it seems to be readily available. Like I said, I, 
I don't know. I don't know why this one just faded from prominence. Um, one of the features that impressed me the most is uh, the thing we mentioned a couple of times here is the reuse of components to change the feel of the game. Like each of the three villains uses those obstacle cubes in totally unique ways. And I think that's brilliant. And as we mentioned, this isn't just like a surface retheme or name changes. The game plays significantly different. Like we talked about how with Ares, you're running around the board, battling servants of war and trying to convert Amazons back to your side. And Ares is throwing up blockades. Whereas when you're playing Circe, you've got these magic beacons that keep showing up that buff her. And you like almost impossible to damage her while they're up on the board. And now going back to those pigs Sean was talking about, well, the whole story with Circe is she's showing up and she's transmuting some of the Amazons into pigs and other Amazons into wolves. And well, the whole thing and the way you lose defense is if they end up in the same region, you have the wolves eating the pigs, which is actually a pretty twisted plot twist. Um, and I think that's fascinating. Like, I am so impressed by how the same set of components leads to such a variety in play. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's uh, they've they've really maximized the use of what they have in the game to, to give you as much as you can in yeah. what isn't, a, you know, a giant Gloomhaven sized box or anything. No, not at all. This is a, a standard Ravensburger box size. The other thing, too, that hasn't happened yet, and hopefully, I have a feeling won't because of the fact that this game's kind of fallen out of prominence, it would be so easy to expand this. Like, you could so easily just have a villain pack that has an oversized tarot size card with the new villain rules and a small pack of cards with it. It's standy, and that's it. That's all you need. And then you have a completely new villain to face in, in Wonder Woman. Now, I also really like what the game's done to reduce the chances of quarterbacking. Now, we use this term a lot, but I'll define it just in case you don't know it. So quarterbacking is when one player takes over for the whole group, right? And it's something that happens in cooperative games where the player who knows the most or knows the games the most, or at least thinks they do, kind of tells all the other players what they should be doing and takes over their turns. This is something that can be a huge problem in any cooperative game. However, the way that Challenge of the Amazon presents the players with incomplete information during the phase where you're actually allowed to talk pretty much eliminates the ability to take over and guide another player's action. Now, that said, I have seen some people on social media mainly point out that they don't like that imperfect information. They don't like only having two of their cards out of three when they're trying to plan and strategize they want to be able to make a definite plan and don't like it when the group plans one thing and one of the players ends up doing something else because of the cards they've drawn now personally in the games i played i love it i think it's a positive feature i love it when i come up with something even better than what we planned like oh, i said i was going to do that but man i drew a whole bunch of plus three cards instead i'm going to go go give aries a beating instead of you know just clearing out some wolves or whatever i i think it's great but I can see how other groups might find this to, to not be to their taste, like potentially even going to the so far as find a flaw in the game. So I got to say, if someone doesn't like this aspect, like it's pretty easy house rule, just allow open communication during the battle begins phase. Yeah. It sounds like some quarterbacks just don't like having their power removed. Huh. If they're that desperate, there are always ways around it. That is possible. That could be those type of players. I don't know. Now, another complaint I have seen about this game is that people have been finding the difficulty too high. Uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe we're just really good or what, but this isn't something we've experienced ourselves. Uh, it seems just about right. Everything feels kind of tense, and we've managed to win a number of times. I, I'm wondering if people are thinking of this as a gateway game. As a, It's Wonder Woman. It's DC Comics. It'll be light and fun. Let's play it with the kids, right? And I'm wondering if the group's board game experience is impacting that difficulty level because this is not a light gateway cooperative game this is not as simple and easy to understand as pandemic or flashpoint fire rescue or forbidden desert this is this is almost closer to gloomhaven jaws of the lion level of trying to plan out your turn using cards which is why i think of it like gloomhaven now it's not gloomhaven it's not like I would call Gloomhaven heavy at times, but to, to win a scenario in Gloomhaven takes some work and cooperation. It's not quite there, but it is a significant step above your gateway cooperative games. And this game has a bit of a learning curve 
And that curves repeated every time you try a new villain because the gameplay is so different and figuring out what actions to do where and when and how to utilize your relics and maximize the use of each character's unique power is going to be a key to winning. And that's not something that's obvious, especially during your first couple plays. Yeah, I, I was in a discord recently and there are people out there who are saying that they're they have played with groups who are expecting 80 percent win with a co-op. Oh or they think it's broken. Uh, now, I'm not sure what to say to those people because if you're winning more than half of your co-op games, I think that's the game that's broken. Um, I, I think that's where the game is broken. Uh, you shouldn't be winning 80% of your games um, with a, with a well-balanced game for me. Yeah, because to me, one of the big draws of a co-op game and what sells it is that near win. And this is the one thing that I think Pandemic did perfectly is I can't play one game of Pandemic because assuming I didn't win. Like Pandemic's a terrible experience. If you play Pandemic for the first time and you win, you'll never go back. You'll hate Pandemic for the rest of your life. You'll be like, why? what's the buzz? What's the hype? But if you come two or three card draws away from winning, you're immediately like, oh, it was so close. Let's try again. And then you'll try again and it'll get so close. You're like, oh, we almost got it. Let's play. And that's the brilliance of that game. And that's what brings people back to it. And that is where you don't want that high win percentage. Whereas I've seen people comparing this to ghost stories, which I think is in the opposite, where you only win like 10 or 15% of the time. And that's pushing it too far. So like I said, I haven't experienced it. I don't know what we've done right uh, or maybe we just got really lucky. Um, one of the things, like, for example, when fighting seriously, if you can get the lasso, the lasso's in play, your chance to win jumps up huge because you can move those obstacle cubes around with you. So it lets you herd the wolves or the sheep. That's a huge ability. If you don't have that card, that fighting seriously is going to be way more difficult. Now, of course, the key to that is one of the heroes you can pick increases your odds of getting that rope because one of the heroes starts with a set of artifacts and gets to pick one. And then the odds of that particular thing being the deck helps but that's what i mean about being an experienced player and knowing the game helping up that win difficulty so moving away from difficulty overall i gotta say i was very pleasantly surprised by wonder woman challenge of the amazons uh this is one of the better cooperative games i've played it does an amazing job of eliminating the alpha gamer problem or the quarterbacking uh that many cooperative games have through the use of a very unique program movement system You've got great replayability, uh, three different villains with different challenge levels that brilliantly uses the same components in different ways to create three rather varied gameplay experiences. Now, the one thing Challenge of the Amazons is not is a gateway game. This is not your first cooperative game, my first cooperative game. This is a cooperative board game for experienced gamers who are used to planning their actions together and working together and strategizing and having long-term plans. While Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons isn't a game I'd break out with a new group of gamers, even if they are hardcore Wonder Woman fans, it's a great game for groups who already have some cooperative gaming experience and are looking for a new challenge. Now, it's going to go over even better if those groups are fan of DC Universe and, of course, Wonder Woman. All right, well, when you have time, be sure to also check out our written review of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons over at TabletopBellhop.com. <laughs> 